But let me start first uh, from a FEMA perspective and can reflect on these last uh, couple of days and how this fits, fits in the broader uh, National Hazards Workshop. When I come and interact with organizations like NHMA, I come into these interactions asking the question, what does mutual partnership look like? It's easy enough for a federal agency to walk in and say, well, let me tell you what we're doing and how you can help me get it done. And while that, that's not inappropriate and there's a space for that, when I approach organizations like the National Hazard Mitigation Association, I want to understand what are those mutual points. I do that because I think it's a more effective way to do what we do, but I also do it because I think it models the kind of thing that we are pursuing with communities, which is about engagement, which is about sitting together and says this doesn't have to be about a cookie cutter approach, this needs to be responding to what the needs are between these two communities. And in this case, we share a very common border, uh, as I look between FEMA and the work that NHMA does. It's been interesting in my work around mitigation uh, in this community over the last decade, and it's only been about the last decade, so I can't talk about 27 or 37 or 50 plus years. But what I'll tell you is what I'm hearing today that I haven't heard before is really a pregnant opportunity related to mitigation. There's an opportunity that has opened up that I haven't, don't think that's been in place for a while. And that played out some of the conversations today. We talked quite a bit about mitigation planning. And what encouraged me about those conversations is that it was not about mitigation planning for the sake of mitigation planning. It was about actually changing something for the people who live in those communities. See, I'm far less concerned about plans and processes. I am concerned about people. That is what builds communities, and that's what we together are all focused on. Now, I guess I'm a bureaucrat. I'll take that as the compliment that was intended to do. I push to make sure that we get the processes to work, yes. Uh, but to the end of what we need to do from the people side. And so we're rehabbing the mitigation plan review process. I use the word rehab intentionally. The bone structure is solid. We've got a good piece of things here. Yet how it operates needs to find some new ways to be more pliable, more agile, and more effective as we move forward. And so I particularly appreciate the conversations that took place on that and the work that this organization is doing with us even this next week as we sit with stakeholders and look at what does it mean to actually get our mitigation plan process to have the greatest impact. Ultimately, where I want to see that go is get beyond white binders that uh, somehow comply with Section 322 of the Stafford Act, although that is part of my job, and get it to the point that we actually see comprehensive and general land use plans reflect this in a way that reflects this is what the community wants to do, that the hazards have been dealt with, they have been informed of the process, and it's changing the way they're doing things. Another dimension that we talked about uh, downstairs in terms of the disaster resilient communities. This is a piece that really hits the fire in my belly. This is the thing, but we actually make a difference and change the pieces. And so we had this happy coincidence as we were talking a bit today about risk map and some of the things that we're pursuing. And the kinds of things that Shirley was talking about are the exact things that we are trying to pursue in a systemic way through risk map. But I say to you with all transparency, all we can do with a federal program and federal dollars is open up opportunities and provide tools. Ultimately, it has to be about the community. So it's a federal program in a resource-constrained environment. I'm required to measure our progress. Uh, some people go, must you? And I said, yes, we must. But there are three things that are driving the risk map program, three measures. I'm going to Triangulation seems to be an in vogue term in Washington again these days. 
Um, and what we've said is as we look at risk map and we want to tell us a story of our success and we want to demonstrate the value that it, the dollars that Congress has given us is producing, we have three things that we're measuring. One of them is the population that we initiate um, risk map projects with. So that initiation component. A second component and this is where large sums of money get spent, has to do with data credibility. Big chunks of our dollars come from the National Flood Insurance Program, from policyholders uh, and the like, and we have to ensure that we can show that connection there. But the end game, the thing that we are working at figuring out the right way to measure, and this is how I'm going to actually be able to describe our success, is action. Have we seen a reduction in the risk? Put whatever word you want to on it. Is it action? Is it risk reduction? Is it, is it disaster resilience? Whatever one of those terms you want to put on it. This has to be decisions that are made in communities. This is way outside the sphere of control of FEMA. But it is in our sphere of influence. And it's the thing that we're committed to. Because if we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year satisfying particular regulatory needs in the National Flood Insurance Program, which we will do, we need to ensure that these broader benefits for communities are being realized. And so we're triangulating. We are going to be able to measure the population we engage. And we're going to be able to tell you stream reaches and whether or not those data are satisfying the standards. At the same time, we're looking at these broader components of action. The final place where I see some of this stuff more connecting is what we talked about last night related to the Presidential Policy Directive. That does give us the opportunity to have this broader conversation about mitigation. I will tell you it's going to make some of us in this room uncomfortable. At times it's been in our interest to narrow the scope of what is mitigation so that we can more clearly define it and claim the space as our own. And what we're being asked to do now, or directed to do by the president, depending on how you want to look at it, is take a broader view of mitigation. It says what does it mean to truly drive resilience in the structural and non-structural environments as we deal with critical infrastructure as well as public health. Folks, it tends to be many of the same actions that produce all of those benefits. And so what I look forward to in the um, months to come as we collaborate with the Natural Hazards Mitigation Association is ways that two things can happen simultaneously. In one side, we can continue to build capacity because capacity is about people and people are who live in our communities and those are the people who make the decisions and those are the people who benefit uh, when those risk-informed, resilient type um, actions are taken. The other side is that the specific actions, we will reduce risk. That's a high order and I looked at Dr. Murdoch stuff yesterday, and I'm looking at the population increase, and those people are going to live somewhere. I've heard some futurists say that as you look at the population increase, about a third of them will probably be accommodated through density on existing footprints, and the other two-thirds of them are going to begin to occupy the remaining open space. But well, we need to make sure that we're taking a far more informed view about where we situate our people, so that they can be resilient, not because we took some structural action to fend off the water and protect them from it, but because we situated in a place where they weren't subject to that hazard to begin with. And so that's the piece that where I come sit from on my side, I get excited about. Uh, and the last day and a half have been uh, in the top five days of my year because of the types of conversations I've been able to have with people in this room who are so committed to those pieces. So I'm encouraged by what you guys are doing. 
uh, and want to make sure that we walk together in that partnership.